I'm Heidi Zuckerman. I've spent my life connecting people to art to make their lives better. This podcast talks about art in contemporary culture and why we should care. Each episode is an impactful conversation with people I find interesting and think you will too about their life, values, and always about why they think art matters. This is Conversations About Art. Hank Willis Thomas is a conceptual artist working primarily with themes related to perspective, identity, commodity, media, and popular culture. His work is included in numerous public collections, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Guggenheim Museum, and the Whitney Museum, among many others. His collaborative projects include Question Bridge, Black Males, In Search of the Truth, The Truth Booth, Writings on the Wall, and the artist-run initiative for art and civic engagement, Four Freedoms. He and I discussed anxiety, infinite wisdom, positivity bias, God, infinite possibility, the quality of the question, and the remaining opportunities for freedom. I'm wondering how you feel about anxiety in our current moment and and how it's affecting you and how you're reacting to it, I guess, and or managing it. Yeah. Well, it ranges really moment to moment and day to day. I think also about which location I am in. I live in New York and my studio's in New York. But over the past few weeks, my friend left his place in Connecticut and I've been staying here. And I was in New York yesterday and I felt a very physiological difference just walking around New York versus somewhere where there's more trees and bird sounds and things like that. And I think that says a lot about the range of experiences people are having around the country as related to like opening up or kind of closing or um, what. And and so um, that to me translates across all of the work that I do as well from uh, studio practice to the work that we do with Four Freedoms that is more politically oriented. Um, how do I uh, best make work that extends beyond my <laughs> current moment in the sense of confusion and often anxiety that you know, over shadows many of my interactions over the past three months. I'm fascinated by this idea of confusion. And for a long time, I mean, obviously a lot of people associate contemporary art with something that's confusing. You know, that's one of the, I think, uphill struggles about trying to convince more people that that contemporary art can be for them. And I have adopted a strategy over time about celebrating the idea of confusion and, and being uncomfortable or sorry, rather being comfortable in an uncomfortable place and really championing the idea that sometimes it's, it's really beneficial to not be able to understand things, but this current confusion for me I don't know if it's tested my limits or if it feels somehow unproductive or more threatening. And I just wonder if you've noticed kind of a difference in, in the confusion or, or how you relate to that idea. One of the terms that I have been thinking a lot about that encapsulates some of my confusion, and I'm not even sure if I agree with it as it applies to me or who it applies to directly but was that your privilege will not protect you. You know, I think there is a way in which a lot of people, especially in the art world who often have maybe economic privilege have been 
able to avoid a lot of the anxieties that affect people around the world on day to day basis. And often when we get wrapped up in the conversations around the art market and art fairs and gallery sales and even sometimes museum things, we lose track of its connection to uh, the reality of most people's lives. And one of the things that this experience has made more real is that, yes, you can run, but you can't hide <laughs> in a way. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think there's a level of confusion around what is safe. You know, like there's with, with, with the virus that attacks your lungs, which is like the essence of our lives. If you get it, there's no guarantee <laughs> who will be protected and who will be okay. Does that make sense? And so I guess the planning <clears throat> around like where to, where to go and, <clears throat> and who to engage with and how to make myself and my family safe is really different. You know, whereas I think oftentimes in, at least in America, we think that moving towards economic comfort will give us, you know, a level of safety and often of course that's an illusion and so that illusion has become more real is that, that too is crazy having, no that's i think that's right i think that's right how does having a family impact how you make art well i wouldn't say that it did really very much until this current moment. I was traveling all over the world and doing exhibitions and shows and talks and spending a good amount of time with my wife and child. My wife had curated the Whitney Biennial and was really very much working on that for most of the first nine months of my daughter's life. So I wound up being a lot more involved then. And then after the show ended, I wound up kind of doing a lot of my own crazy, hectic work and getting caught up. And then this happened and we didn't have childcare like we did before. And we didn't have um, a lot of the, the kind of assumed comforts that we had before. And therefore, making work has basically all but stopped for me because uh, I both feel a necessity to spend more time with my daughter because I don't know if there ever will be another time when I don't have any excuse but to spend time with her. (laughs) And I don't know, you know, as related to my previous comment, you know, how how much time I'll even get to spend with her, depending on which mits, you know, if there is any misfortune. My wife had the, the virus, so that was a kind of intense moment of reflection. Mm-hmm. So now I'm really much, very much thinking about the future and legacy and what kind of legacy I would like to leave my daughter and what kind of work I would make that would be speaking to her should I not be around in 20 years or 30 years when she gets to really understand what I have been doing throughout my career. That's heavy and real and I appreciate your answer and I'm looking not at you because we're recording this just as an audio and not a video but you have instead of an image of yourself and an image of your work on the screen and it says I am underlined amen and I was 
thinking about the notion of, I guess, the divine or the communication of, of something greater than, than us and, and the role that that kind of celebration or acknowledgement plays in, in the notion of legacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about the choice of that word? I mean, I think about Amen as an individual expression, but also sharing the verbalization of that, I guess, blessing in community? Yeah. Well, I hate to do this, but you are the esteemed curator and museum director on this conversation. And I often find that people with your ability for decoding and looking at the larger kind of context of our work are sometimes more articulate than the artist in speaking of the work. And so I, yeah, I'm most curious, you know, what it means to you. Mm-hmm. And as it, and also as it applies to, to your, your family and legacy. Yeah, so I, I like the idea of the underscoring of am, you know, I mm. am. And I, anyone who has been listening along uh, to the podcast or who's pretty much ever met me knows that I'm a practitioner of meditation and yoga. And, you know, I am is, is also in Sanskrit, satnam, right? And so that it's the most kind of, um, essential blessing and acknowledgement of existence. I am. And yeah, it's like the deepest form of, of being and being present. And then for me, amen is what's said in response, really, I guess, more than something that I would uh, say kind of on my own, like I would say it in response to what someone else would say. So for me, there's that kind of exchange or dialogue between the self and community. And then if you read it kind of over and over, uh, that through the repetition, you know, I am, amen, I am, amen, I am, amen. It has through that repetition, this kind of building power of, you know, self and other, and then this idea that that's where we find God uh, in the idea that we are both everything and nothing. We are both everything and nothing. I am the alpha and the omega. I am. And I get Satnam. I, I knew that you would bring a, a very deep reading to it. I did not know that you'd also bring a very personal and spiritual reading to it. So thank you for that. I going back to your first question around anxiety. I think that I think the this connection to our breath and to the present moment and to affirmation as a method for moving through times of curiosity and anxiety. I, I, I don't know if there's ever been a moment in human history where more people in the world were more mindful of their breath and of the things they have instead of the things that they don't have and appreciative of every moment. And so when I heard you talking about it, I, I heard the connection between the individual eye and then the global 
and universal I and the am being underlined I I never looked that deep into it because I was this this is uh, I, I remixed a series of of civil rights posters that said I am a man from the 1968 seven, uh, 1968 Memphis Sanitation Workers March mm-hmm. and they, they said I am a man and the am being underlined and then I remixed it to say I am the man I, uh, I'm human I'm many I am yours <laughs> all of these different kind of ways of uh thinking about the, what goes after I am. And it was a series of 20 paintings and the final one read, I am, amen. And for me, it was because I had to recognize ultimately that I am a blessing. And I love making work that ask the reader to take on a personal perspective and engaging with it. And so you can't read I am a man without thinking about yourself. <laughs> and so if we're all blessings, then how shall we navigate the world and how shall we look at ourselves is very much embedded in that. And I think that maybe ties into some of the things that you read into it as well, which you know, really helps me see the work in a broader perspective. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Super beautiful. A few years ago, I was really fortunate to do a a leadership program at the Aspen Institute. And they gave us a system of charting our own moral compass on a vertical and horizontal axis. And probably typical for me, I rejected their structure and, you know, supplemented my own. And I've talked about this before with the idea that on the vertical axis, the lowest point is fear and the highest point is transcendence. And as you were talking about anxiety and curiosity, I thought about that same kind of vertical axis and maybe the closer we get to anxiety, the farther we are from curiosity. And maybe the closer we get to curiosity, the further we are from anxiety. The, fir- the, the closer we get to anxiety, the further we are from curiosity. Mm-hmm. Right. So the more anxious we are, the less curious we can be. And maybe the more curious we can be the less anxious we can be. I'm not I sure. Def- I just thought about it as you were talking. I definitely think there's a connection between curiosity and confidence, which I would not have normally made that association because to be curious is to, in a sense, believe in yourself and believe in your capacity to comprehend something that is foreign to you. And I, I don't know if it's a one to one, and but I do think that there is definitely something about curiosity that leads you away from anxiety. Except I'm like, unless we're talking about horror movies, maybe. Except you know that scene when like there's a creepy noise and you <laughs> want to know what it is. Um. That being said, that yeah, the, I think there it's curiosity. I think it's also acceptance is, uh, I think, uh, uh, an antidote to anxiety. The acknowledging that the, there is a greater order than the one that we can kind of organize with our minds and with our bodies. I think that's right. And where I was going with the idea is something that was shared with me recently, which is if you can be curious about what's coming, 
then it feels, even if it might be something horrible, you know, but mm. uh, if you can be curious about it and try and figure out the lesson in it or the why or believe that everything, not that everything happens for a reason at all, but just that somehow we get presented with the exact teacher that we need in every moment. And if we can be curious, if I can be curious about that rather than, you know, anxious about it, then that's productive for me. Mm -hmm. Is that why you're doing this show? <laughs> I am doing this show because I know that art matters. And I'm going to ask you about that. And because I know that art makes people better people and makes people's lives better. And I haven't been able to understand why more people don't believe that. So I'm doing this show and talking to people that I think are interesting and hoping that through the variety of people that, that I talk to, that people will find something for themselves uh, mm -hmm. that somehow flips a switch. So it's basically straight up proselytizing. <laughs> and what did you take away from your conversation with Tom Sachs? My conversation with Tom Sachs, I mean, I've known Tom such a long time. I've known you a long time too, but maybe I've known Tom, I think even longer. Uh, and part of what I took away from that conversation was the relentless commitment to personal objective and the strength of conviction, regardless of external feedback and the celebration of, uh, you know, monumental projects. And, and I've always been interested in things that people say are impossible Right? Like, well, that's not possible or that can't be done. You know, that's, I'm, that's what I like to do. The things that, that people think can't be done. And Tom definitely emphasizes that, you know, commitment to the, if not impossible, definitely the improbable. It's kind of the return of the space cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> He's like such a ruggedly, I would say, if not optimistic, def um, productive, <laughs> mm -hmm. stalwart uh, individual. I think it's amazing to me just seeing how he can take the smallest curiosity and make it a massive experiment. And I definitely take inspiration from people like that and artists like that who yeah who will make something literally out of nothing and, and get, engage in practices that invite other people to explore their own kind of unique and individual quirks that can make something that's beautiful and or powerful I totally agree. And one of the things that's starting to happen with the podcast, which is really exciting to me and, and happened with exhibition programs that I have put together in the past as well, is that they become self-referential in a way where there are these echoes um, or patterns or repetition. And what you just said in terms of the ability to make something out of nothing is exactly what Lance Armstrong said about why he loves art and artists. You know, is that ability to create something where something previously never existed or to give new life or meaning to something that was previously unacknowledged or disregarded or unseen. Mm. Yeah, and I think what, I, I was thinking about you, I think before we, 
I don't know. I was thinking about you a month or so ago. And is my recollection correct that you really oversaw a massive reinvention of the Aspen Art Museum? Yes, that was me. <laughs> and, and not to say that I was making something out of nothing. It was a, very much a creative act, though. And an act of collaboration and of dreaming big. And I, I, I don't know. I, I was just thinking about that. <laughs> Thank you, and I appreciate the the spirit of generosity as you've characterized it there. And one of the great gifts I think that we can be given is the perspective of others on us and the work that we've done or do and. A lot of people spoke to me, mostly after the fact, a little bit during about the building that I did there, not not just the physical building of the museum, but the but the building of the brand or the building of the institution um, as inherently and profoundly entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. But no one's talked about it as this um, creative act. So I'm going to sit with that. Thank you for that. Well, yeah, just thinking about even the top floor and the view to the mountain. And, and when I was there a few years ago, there was those Miranda July pieces that were outside of the museum, mm -hmm. which I, I've seen them around a few times. They just seem to really connect in a different way. The, could you describe the pedestals? Yeah, so... There were three pedestals um, which people could stand on and you could choose where you wanted to, to be, of course, and you could step on one and step off and step on another. And so you could choose one or you could choose, you know, all three and tons of people uh, recorded themselves standing on them, you know, with these selfies. And uh, I don't remember the exact language because it, is so smart in the choice of words, but the basic concept was, you know, like good, better, best. Um, but it was this, I, you know, reference to self. And I kind of played around with the idea when I would come to work every day of, you know, am I good or am I better or am I best, right? And is best, you know, sometimes better than good or sometimes good better than best, right? So um, kind of playing around with expectation and association. And, you know, sometimes the thing that other people think is is the pinnacle um, it is not actually sometimes, you know, lesser or more um, self-contained or self-referential is, is, you know, maybe the best. All right. And that reminds me that the show that was up that Courtney was working on was was gray area. Yeah, right. it was, yeah. The shades, um, what was it? It was, it definitely had the term gray, but yes, yes, it was. And I believe it was just talking about political discourse or mm -hmm. kind of the way in which there is a level of gray this in being right yes totally <laughs> when you said that good might be better than best it just reminded <laughs> me of like huh like these this other connection of often when we make work or we try to make strong political gestures and statements and they're really of a specific moment they their potency is often because it feels like it is the best argument the best way of making an impact at that period of time from i think a kind of historical lens they might become antiquated or seen as really just a step in a direction or maybe that which could have been the best direction <laughs> it could have been a good direction mm -hmm. or it could have been a, a bad direction and, I, and I, I, I'm 
the reason that I'm like kind of going in these circles is because I am in the, this self examination period of both trying to direct my own action as a creative, as well as my own self evaluation. Because back to the I am, who I say I am on a given moment and a given day as I try to make, whether it be through conversation or actual an object, who I say I am will have a huge influence on the lasting impact of whatever I create. And so if I am anxious as a great creator, I believe I'll probably be making things that have uh, the vibrate anxiety whereas if i say i'm curious <laughs> which is where the i am series is really about uh i believe it'll have a different resonance and i i think that anxiety i mean i think that the the i'm well i'll just say i'm really trying to figure out how to begin a process of creation that is about abundance and about optimism and affirmation without cynicism and fear. And I don't know if that's good art. It just feels like it would make me feel good. <laughs> well, I'm always in search of the both and. I am and, a both and person as well. Yeah. And, and, I think if I, well, I'll just say I'm also the eternal optimist. So my hope for us, the collective us, is that this moment of pause, let's call it the pandemic pause, uh, that if we can come out the other side with a better understanding of the both and, that would be for me incredibly productive, you know, for the good society as I hope it to be. Can you define the both end? I wonder if our both ends are the same. For me, the both end is the celebration or acceptance of seemingly disparate things. So, Maybe it used to be the idea of postmodernism or something, you know, where seemingly disparate um, elements can can be embraced. And and when I did my you know master's um, thesis, it was about it really took like a postmodernist feminist perspective. Um, now I, I think it's more simple. <laughs> it's about being able to instead of the either or instead of having to choose, uh, instead of pushing uh, difference, it's about trying to find commonality and being good with the both and instead of the either or. So the hero and the villain being one and the same? It could be, or it could be being creative and destructive or mm. being present and absent mm. or being individual and collective. Yeah. I think that is we because we've been, especially in Western societies conditioned to apply a very specific type of logic to our valuations of things, we often don't know how to embrace a broader stream or scope of alternate realities being embodied in the same thing. I think that's where you started also talking about people being confused by contemporary art and I've been more recently looking at contemporary art as 
a, an attempt by not only the artists, also the institutions and the collectors and the f- advocates and fans as a method to get back to our you know, uh, infinite and ancestral wisdom which in many ways was lost because of the progress of the industrial revolution where things were able to be quantified and qualitated in such a way and then made value being made around them that anything that wasn't quantifiable and qualitative in a productive sense lost its value immediately or was kind of put into this kind of uh, esoteric kind of corner of society that mysticism has kind of embraced. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Yeah, and I'm fascinated by this idea of ancestral wisdom. And it, in so many ways, I guess, runs counter to like the celebration of uh, perpetual youth and all of these efforts towards wanting to be young, right? Look young, act young, feel young, you know? Um, What's the next thing, the next new, the end? I'd love to know what some of that ancestral wisdom would be and not as a way of sort of short-circuiting the personal learning, but maybe being able to go further because you get like a leg up, you know, or you get like the inside information or you get like kind of the, um, the secret society, uh, you know, like, Hey, here's this chunk of wisdom so that instead of you needing to spend X number of years or days or hours or whatever, figuring out on yourself, we're just going to give you that if you're willing to acknowledge it as true so that then you can go further and find other things. Yeah. Well, I think that's what, at its best, if you're taking the more optimistic approach to how fine art functions, even in the commercial market, even in, in the present moment, is that what many or maybe all of the artists who are making a a certain level of impact have done is tapped into something that is vibrating or emanating a a larger, a greater amount of wisdom than uh, is often acknowledged. Like if you start to think about like uh, well, even when we're talking about Tom, you know, he's 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 tapped into a certain kind of line. Uh, uh, he's connected very closely and very <laughs> um, intentionally tuned in to a a spectrum that, in order to really engage with him and his work, you have to also embrace. And I think that and what often means about breaking systems in order to make something new or Mm -hmm. um, seeing the connection between the, 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 literally the universe and the individual. And so when I think about the ancestral wisdom, I think that, well, you know, your ancestors brought you to this moment, you know, with the help of the ancestors of all the people whose lives you've interacted with up until this moment. And what happens when we start to really acknowledge that we are part of the continuum and that the choices that were made by so many people before us have brought us to like this current moment 
like on the edge of a new reality every breath we take and when i think about ancestral wisdom it's like what responsibility do i have that's as i'm saying with my daughter now that i'm much more aware of how the moments every decision i make now is in some ways a directive for her and if i'm not being mindful i'm not actually i'm not actually giving it the value that i place on it so giving it the attention that matches the value that i place on it mm. so i'm really trying to say like my i chose amen because my grandmother is a very religious christian and she really did embed in me and my cousins at least this idea that we were blessings and that and i asked her where she, she came up with this affirmation that she taught us as kids which said like i'm lovable i'm capable and all of these kind of affirmations that um she said that her grandmother used to say that to her and i realized oh this goes back way further than i can count and i wonder when i think about my anxiety or other fears or negative things if you know are th there are things that were also passed down through ancestors that are subconscious small framings of perspective i know you know some of my friends whose family members are holocaust survivors have really have ancestral trauma um and so i'm just trying i don't know i'm really just trying to process it all and think about how in moments like these to stay tapped into the, the 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 wisdom that has led me to this point in my life that all the people who loved me and my mother and my father and all the people who tried to remind us of who we are in moments of fear and doubt so that i can put pass that on to my daughter and to others I think this ties so beautifully into this notion of wanting to be seen and the idea of the affirmations. It's such an incredibly kind approach to connecting you to yourself and your grandmother to you and her grandmother to her, you know, this, this notion of, again, I am, you know, but also what comes after that, you know, I am seen, I am loved, I am capable, I am abundant, I am a blessing. And I am you. Mm -hmm. And because we're all reflections of one another. And if we, I think I, I, I just recently learned about negativity bias, which is a theory that suggests that all things being equal, that people tend to, if, if something equally positive and equally negative happens, what is negative will likely get more attention and more weight. And I wonder if that's, I don't know if that's actually a human instinct or if it's one that has been instilled in us. And so I want, I, I, and I think there, there are people who have a positivity bias that, or, or focus on that and therefore create a world that, um, for themselves and those around them that reflects that and i'm wondering if we can if, it can, if that can also be, a, be contagious and i think if anything can do it it can be fine art so that goes back to your other question like why is art important 
is because art is the realm of the infinite possibility. And if we have society, if we don't, if we don't have a place in society for infinite possibility, then we have infinite limitations and we won't be able to grow and evolve and advance. So I love that you answered what is my go-to question on, on each of these because I'm trying to create sort of a patchwork of answers about the question as to why art matters. So thank you for doing that. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Four Freedoms Project because in terms of shifting widely held perspectives, uh, there in this moment in time may, from my perspective, um, not be another area where there is no gray space. And that's in, in the realm of politics. And you guys put together the Four Freedoms Project and forefronted right away the idea that it was nonpartisan. And I'd love to have you just talk a little bit about the why of that project and some of what you see as the successes and, and uh, also some of the remaining opportunities. I'll, I'll be adapting that term remaining opportunities for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so in 2016, really 2015, my friend Eric Gottesman and I realized that they, there was an opportunity to engage in a different way with the political system because of the Citizens United uh, ruling by the United States government that basically said that money is a form of speech and therefore it opened the door for super PACs and 501c4s to engage in political discourse in different ways than previously existed. And we thought that it would be fun <laughs> to start a super PAC as a conceptual art project because you know fine art is often about crazy ideas and funny money and so is politics and we started it as a super PAC and from the beginning we're never really interested in, in working the way that a super PAC is supposed to work which is about like championing a specific championing a specific candidate or trashing them and but we felt that just by being the first artist on super PAC we could change the conversation of what the role of artists in civic life could be and so we did exhibitions and town halls and billboards in 2016 that really involved asking the artists to do what they do <laughs> which is ask questions we say great art ask questions great design answers answers them and the quality of the questions is what dictates the quality of the answers and so the the timelessness of art is why you know these billboards that we made even then are still relevant and then we wound up not being able to work with that many other uh, nonprofit organizations i think you were an exception because we were a 51c because we were a super PAC. And then we, so we wound up closing the super PAC and we're a fiscally sponsored LLC and moved on to doing this 50 state initiative in 2018 where we did over 200 billboards in all 50 states plus over 100 exhibitions and 120 town halls in all 50 states plus DC and Puerto Rico. And worked with about 800 artists to really raise the level of political engagement in kind of creative spaces with a level of awareness that is that I, I don't think had been seen before 
I'm sure no, our I'm president yeah. helped make a lot of institutions more aware of their role. And I also believe though that yeah, museums and galleries are civic spaces and artists are civic leaders and that we haven't often seen ourselves as that and haven't often taken on the responsibility of leading in the ways that we could and should because we are the storytellers of our generation and if we're only telling stories in our small kind of areas um, rather than speaking to the larger society we miss incredible opportunities to make change and so the change is inevitable but it often winds up being dumbed down and taking three or four decades between before something that's like really important in art discourse gets to the mainstream. So yeah, so we were interested. So that's why we were anti-partisan because we realized that you know, the Republicans of yesterday are the Democrats of today and the Democrats of today are the Republicans of yesterday. And then these parties keep switching. And so why should we be stuck into uh, any of these specific value systems that we know that it's all really a matter of perception and that the ideas are what really matter. It's interesting how connected that is, right? Because art is also about perception and oftentimes what's most important in the artwork is, is the idea as well. Yeah. I, I am super grateful that you have taken the time to talk with me today and to speak so authentically about where you are and what you're considering and where you might go. And I'm definitely going to spend the rest of my day, if not the rest of my life, trying to cultivate that positivity bias. So thank you for that. Well, you clearly have done it in many ways before. And I think in moments where there were areas of growth <laughs> in the past, it's just about bringing that level of awareness to those moments. And that's what I, that's what I'm focusing on. I, when I, I don't take the ancestral comments lightly because you, I think we do, especially those of us who are either descendants of slaves or immigrants, which is pretty much all of us uh, have to acknowledge that someone's survived so that we could, you know, someone endured incredible pain uh, so that we, so that we could get to where we are and took incredible risks uh, and believed. So the least that we can do for future generations is apply a level of, august ambition and joy and positivity so that they can reach for it when it's time amen amen thank you conversations about art is part of Art, a multi-platform project that connects all to art through a podcast series books talks program brand collaborations, TV, and more. This episode was produced by Simon Illa. Our theme music was composed by Eric McDougall. Blake Migden assists with social media content editing. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and review us on whichever platform you listened, as it helps us further our goal of connecting all to art. We will be back again every Tuesday with new episodes. Thanks so much for listening.